Welcome to episode 35 of Fundraising Demystified. Today we have Nick Cuomo, former pro esports gamer turned co-founder and CEO of allstar.gg. He recently announced his $12 million Series A after raising a seed during the peak of 2021. Nick has an inspiring background as a former pro esports player way back in the early Counter-Strike days, then pursued a marketing career to then launch his startup shortly before the pandemic. We talk about the rise of esports, how the capital raising markets changed dramatically from 2021 to 2023, the impact of OpenAI's latest Sora announcement on his business, and how he's focused on hitting his KPIs to attract capital. Welcome to the show, Nick. Thanks, Jason. Uh, glad to be here. Appreciate you having me. Uh, I'm excited to, to share your story. You've uh, raised a couple rounds of financing, most recently a Series A uh, mid last year. And I uh, would love for the audience to get to know you and kind of a little bit about your your background, your story, and ultimately what led you to starting All Star. Yeah, totally. So um, I'm a former pro gamer. I played Counter Strike in high school and college, and uh, obviously left a very big impression on me. I started this company sometime later, and um, when I played, my claim to fame was I made videos that um, went viral before YouTube and Twitch were really a thing. Uh, the next tournament I went to. I could just sense kind of the room shifted. People wanted to talk to me that didn't even know my name and everyone was interested to see how I played. So it left a really big impression on me. I enjoyed making content. I enjoyed distributing it. Uh, for most gamers, it's not fun. It's labor intensive. It's hard work. And so we started All Star in 2019 to change that. And our mission uh, unchanged to this day is to enable any gamer to be a creator. And uh, what we're doing is we build technology that makes sharing your gameplay simpler than posting a selfie. We love to make creating content easier and more fun. And uh, that's what we've been doing for the last couple of years. No, I appreciate you giving that context. And, you know, I always find it interesting, Kelly, the OG esports before esports was even branded esports, uh, you know, passionate gamer. You were kind of early on that, uh, that industry, but, you know, looking at your, your history and your career, like obviously that was way back when, you know, you had a, a full career leading up to, to All-Star. What was kind of the general sentiment of your career leading up to, to All-Star? Yeah, so I, I met a lot of um, really great people in esports that kind of helped me early in my career. Some of the first jobs I did outside of like you know, working at my dad's general store on Long Island as a kid and 7-Eleven after that. I did like jobs in esports. So I'd go run tournaments and do admin and set up events and uh, I used to pitch dust off at the Samsung experience in New York City and stuff like that. Uh, these are all like jobs I got through people I met in esports. After esports, I went to college and I actually had to kind of retire from esports. I basically had to choose if I wanted to graduate from school or continue to be competitive because both took the same amount of time. So I, I hung up the mouse in basically retired from esports, focused on school. I'm a graphic designer by trade. So my background is, you know, I used to designing code websites. I'd sell them to, you know, small businesses, kind of freelanced for a few years, used to have some contractors that would work with me. So I was always like an entrepreneur by default. That was kind of my first instinct was to work for myself. And uh, then I decided to try working for someone else. I got into graphic design, worked at a digital studio called uh, Blue Fountain Media, became, uh, you know, an agency uh, in New York that did everything from like marketing to mobile apps to websites was there for a little over four and a half years. I was a senior account director, ran like a third of that company and to learn the ins and outs of digital marketing, product development, you know, teams and everything in between. They taught me the ins and outs of SaaS sales. And uh, I got to, you know, lead some of their sales teams and really um, just learned a ton about being on the inside of a venture back software company and, and seeing how, uh, how that kind of thing develops and scales and grows. Yeah, really just kind of fell in love with startups. And I saw an opportunity in the industry. I saw a lot of my esports connections, starting companies, getting funded. I saw this momentum in the industry. I kind of feel drawn to this. I saw a big opportunity. I, I still play games. I just was not satisfied by anything that was out there. And, uh, and that's kind of what got me into, into gaming and into All-Star uh, again. And ultimately... Um, you know, I think my, my skill sets at the time, I felt like I was, I was prepared. I kind of knew how to execute. I felt like I knew how to, I knew the people we needed. I could recruit that team. I could build that product and, um, you know, get the, 
things uh, going in the right direction. This is episode number 45 of Fundraising Demystified. Today, I'm excited to introduce to you Colby McKenzie, an M&A attorney turned founder who decided to start a cannabis technology business who raised over 12 million and ran a phenomenal process to sell his company to Wheat Maps. We get a masterclass on how to strategically sell your company in this episode. Colby walks us through the key lessons he applied in his company after being involved in over $280 billion in transactions as an attorney at a big law firm. And even talking to Colby brought up a lot of memories of my exit to Walmart and how founders have to really dial in their narrative differently for each potential acquirer when trying to sell a company and run an incredibly tight process to make sure that you're able to get it across the finish line. You just never know what might be the one thing that causes you to blow up the deal and miss out on a wealth generating opportunity. Welcome to the show, Colby. Happy to be here. Happy to be here, my friend. Uh, I'm excited to, to have you on. You and I have had a couple chats, you know, prior to having you on the podcast. You know, I find your background incredibly interesting. Starting in law, going into launching a, a VC backed startup, and then coming back to law and investing in startups. Uh, I think you have an interesting story that has a lot to, you know, to our audience that can learn and kind of hear from your background. It'd be great for you just to share a little bit about your story, you know, starting as a lawyer and kind of what gave you that urge to to start a company and then we'll we'll take it from there. Yeah, happy to run you through it. I definitely have what I would say is a bit of a unique journey, um, but it's given me perspective that I think few have. And I've started as a M&A attorney at Weill Gottschall, for, for those of you that don't know, big New York-based firm, one of the top in the country. And being at Weill was really unique in that it gave me access to things in my 20s that you typically wouldn't get access to. I'm sitting in boardrooms of multi-billion dollar companies. Now, granted, that's as the minute taker, but still having access to these types of things was incredible. And then you got the opportunity to work on deals like Verizon AOL and the $280 plus billion dollar divestiture of uh, GE Capital, like really awesome things to get to soak in in your 20s. I knew all along that I wanted to take a more entrepreneurial journey. So walked in like a crazy person one day and said, this has been great, but I quit. I jumped out, started my own boutique equity fund. I got pulled into actually co-founding a company uh, and ultimately got uh, that to an exit. So I became an exited founder, got my letter jacket to, and everything. And all of this took place in like a five and a half year span. So really hard sprint, uh, a lot of learnings along the way. Uh, and it was something that I had always wanted to do and, and reaching that kind of pinnacle was, was awesome. And so it was well worth kind of jumping out uh, of the, and building the airplane along the way, so to speak. Well, kind of having that, that PETH label, as we call it, the post exited founder, background and opportunity opens up a lot of doors for you once you've achieved it. But let's take a step back. A lot of our listeners are are still in that grind. Maybe they recently left their their job similar to, to how you did it and they're taking that leap of faith and they're in the current grind, whether it's looking to raise capital. I think you 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 kind of glossed over that whole experience. So let's let's talk about your experience at Enlightened, the VC back startup that you built and you know share a little bit about what you did at that company, why'd you start it? And we'll dive in a little bit more. Yeah. So quick, quick background on it and, and funny aside. So Enlighten was in the cannabis space focused cannabis technology company. And I still go back and catch up with friends at Wild and like, oh, you're the weed guy, which for anybody that knows me is like quite hilarious. <laughs> That's the title and tag that I have. But uh, I guess when you found a, a company in cannabis technology, that's the that's the label that you get from kind of the the mainstream and kind of the interesting thing is almost to the day I delivered on an exit that was to a strategic that fit the profile that we talked about five years prior uh, and, and actually did it right at the five year mark. So it was pretty awesome to actually have it come to fruition, which is rare with startups to actually have an exit in mind and then five years later have it play out like you thought. Welcome to episode 32 of Fundraising Demystified. Today we have Jeremy Vaughn with us, CEO and co founder of Start Left Security, a cybersecurity software company for developers. They've raised a $3 million seed round after passing $1 million in ARR. Jeremy walks us through the critical moment he meets his mentor to get his first check why he decided to participate in multiple accelerator programs, how he managed fundraising like a sales process, 
and how he was on the brink of running out of money multiple times, but still managed to close new clients and successfully raise a seed round. Welcome to the show, Jeremy. Thank you. Good to be here. <laughs> now, I'm excited to, to hear your story and be able to kind of understand your lessons to share to founders on how you went about raising capital. So let's just jump right into it. Can you just tell founders a little bit about you and what you're doing at Start Left Security? Yeah, so um, I would say graduated with a finance degree, um, which gave me a little bit of finance chops to talk the language of investors, right? Business language. Um, and then when smartphones came out, I just knew technology was where I needed to go. And so uh, that happened to also be the recession, <laughs> 2008, 2009. So moved into tech. Um, and so been a tech entrepreneur um, in and around software, software development um, for the last 16 years. 16 years. And so, um, built, uh, start left security over the last couple of years, um, and brought it to market in 2019. So you started in 2019 and you recently raised, uh, a seed round of around 3 million back in the summer of 2023. That's four years. What were you doing in that time? Like what, uh, <laughs> what was the business achieving? What were you working on? How'd you stay afloat? How'd that work? Blood, sweat, and tears, man. Everybody jokes about the ramen noodles and all that kind of stuff. I didn't have it that bad, <laughs> but it was sheer grit, just to be honest with you. We, I raised a small angel round from a local investor that I had known for a few years prior. Um, basically said, hey, I'm going to build, I'm bringing this technology. It's patented to market. And here's the opportunity presented to him. He's like, hey, listen, I've I've always believed in you. I knew you at your previous business roles and things like that. He had somebody do that earlier in his career, right? He's like, somebody came in and just kind of changed the trajectory of his life. And so he wanted to pay it forward. That was the guy that he chose to pay it forward. So I'm incredibly grateful and blessed that I met him. And at that particular time, he had a little bit of money to throw at a struggling startup, right? I had to figure out like, hey, how do I create a bigger network and start to grow and meet people in other areas? And so... Um, I decided to join some accelerator programs that ex extended my network to like New England, um, Northeast area, um, more in the Florida area. So like I started covering more of, um, the East coast, right. And try to get more, um, more our name and, and things out there. That's when COVID, uh, you know, hit. So I started creating relationships with investors back when that happened. Um, and said, Hey, I'm going to keep on building. You know, nobody wanted to put money to work during that time. Um, I actually had some big deals, uh, that I had investors lined up with that. If these deals came in, they were going to back me and we could go accelerate. Right. COVID hit, everything fell apart. The, the snowball just blew up. <laughs> right. And so, um, I basically took a step back and said, okay, I'm just going to educate people. I'm going to still create relationships with investors and really just change the position of our, our, uh, talk track, which is, Hey, I'm going to go create revenue. I'm going to figure this out. I'm going to, um, educate the market, form channel partnerships. And what metrics do you want to see us achieve? And then that way it'll make it make our, make me come back with a more valuable conversation of, Hey, I, we've done this on the product side. We've done this. We're, we're reaching these revenue metrics and really just wanted to keep investors close to our story um, and actually see us execute. And that became a really cool thing because the investors started to stay close with us and they saw us execute. And I had to keep our reminding them like, I'm doing this with no money, right? Imagine what we could do, what my team could do if we had a little bit of cash. We got a lot of channel partners throwing us uh, deals and we were able to get up and over a million dollars in revenue before we even started the seed round race. And so that was just us proactively being like, you know what, economic times right now are really hard. Investors don't really have the confidence to invest right now. We got to do something else. <laughs> so that's what we did.